Welcome to Einstein. So I am uh, Dr. Lewis Weiss, and I am a co-director of the Einstein Global Health Center. Uh, Jacqueline uh, Akar, Jackie, stand up there, uh, is the other co-director. And I think most of you have met Jill Ralphman, who's the associate director, and has been tireless in working with uh, Catherine Macalaba from uh, um, Sorry about this. I'm going, I'm going to do this. Eco Health Alliance, who's our partner in this, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, William uh, Koresh, who also coined the term One Health and uh, also is with Eco Health Alliance. Um, so welcome. We're actually we're only, we're actually going to start on time, but in fact, in typical Einstein tradition, we started five minutes late, which actually means we're ten minutes early. If you, um, Einstein has a long history of global health. And uh, this is um, one of many conferences we've had. We've been having these uh, biannually, and we try to seek out topics we think are of interest to global health centers in medical schools. And I think One Health is a topic who is, that has uh, been long coming to medical education. And we'll get a better definition of One Health as, as we go along. Um, but essentially, that intersection of health in wildlife health in domestic animals, health in humans, and how things go between them, coupled with an appreciation for the in impact of the environment and economics on all of that. And one can see how that really intersects with um, health care in the United States, with changes that are occurring in the world, uh, with developing in the rest of the world. And so I think it's a, it's a very pertinent topic uh, for medical schools. So some logistics before I have the pleasure of introducing our new dean. Um, for those of you interested in CME, uh, the EEDS system uh, allows you to online sign up and get credit for your attendance. The information on this is in the blue folder that you've been given. For those of you that are already jonesing from a lack of Wi-Fi access, we do indeed have Wi-Fi. So if you look in your Wi-Fi from Montefiore, and we are indeed part of the Montefiore uh, healthcare system, the large healthcare system. Uh, you will see Montefiore guest Wi Fi, and you can sign in, no password required. Um, I would like to thank our CME uh, people who have been tirelessly working as well Vic Catcher and his team, Anne Marie Martinez, uh, Marilyn Sasso, Donna Esterine, uh, Michelle Lugo, Cynthia Lewis, who have all worked uh, very hard with Jill. Uh, to get all the CME in place uh, for this. And with that, I'm going to welcome our new dean, Dr. Tomaselli, who came to us from Hopkins uh, to give some opening remarks. Lewis, um, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure for me to be here. As you, as you noted, I'm relatively new at this. I've been on the ground for about four months. I come from a place that uh, has a large footprint, as does Einstein, in uh, global and international health. And I think the One Health approach um, is, uh, is, is one that I, I believe uh, is really important and synergizes the uh, activities to really maintain and improve the health of our globe and all of its occupants. I don't think anybody needs to rem be reminded anymore about the importance of the health of the globe by just looking across the country at California and the impact that climate change is having not only on our economy, but on the health of all occupants, animal, vegetable, mineral of this globe. And oftentimes, um, a disproportionate impact uh, on those members of our, uh, of our global community that can least afford to suffer the, the downsides of those impacts. So, I think this, uh, this conference is an important um, um, uh, point in time and in, an inflection point where, in fact, uh, these methods and, and discussion about, about global health of all components of, the, of, uh, of, of this, uh, of our uh, global society, really does need to be brought to the fore in medical education. And I'm hoping that this is one of those uh, inflection points that will allow us to do that. We at Einstein have a um, large number of initiatives ac across the globe in, in, in maintaining and improving the health of everybody on the planet, including uh, everywhere from the Bronx to the Far East to South Asia to uh, Africa 
um, and um, South America and Central America. We um, view these programs as being very diverse uh, with respect to the populations and the needs. However, they share one thing, and that one common goal is to improve the overall health of, of people on our planet. And I think that's really the main goal of, of implementing uh, the One Health approach to, uh, to, to uh, global health care. And I think it's important for anybody who's training in, in the medical education space to hear about uh, this approach. So let me uh, not get in the way by making any further comments, except to say I want to thank Lewis, uh, Jill, and Catherine for putting this all on. I will apologize. I'm going to have to duck out. But I also thank them for arranging for this to be recorded so that I can actually watch it at a later time as well. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to Einstein, and enjoy the next uh, day and a half. So I'd like to introduce our, our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Dr. Koresh from um, EcoHealth Alliance. Um, who I think will define in a better way One Health for us, as well as, as well as welcome, since you were one of the coin, people who coined the term. Fair enough? Great. Fair enough. I'll try my best. Well, first of all, thanks to Einstein, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, for having me here. This is the first time, I was delighted, I have faculty. This is the first time I've been here not a patient. <laughs> so if that tells you a little about my history here, in fact, with Dr. Weiss, who was my personal physician um, for quite a while. And um, so I want to kind of give you a little background on One Health and how um, some of us got here um, and welcome you to the family. Um, and then just run through a lot of examples of how we're seeing uh, One Health being used around the world from our kind of personal experiences and link it into some of the talks you'll be hearing about today. Uh, so a little background on EcoHealth Alliance. It's about 45 years old. It was a, traditionally started as a wildlife group, um, but changed its name about 10 years ago, eight or nine or 10 years ago, to EcoHealth Alliance because the work of the organization was really about linking ecology and health and the alliance is about our partnerships around the world. So while we're a small organization, we have thousands of individuals that work at different organizations around the world in a partnership for implementing projects, co-designing projects, coming up with ideas, um, and then really putting those to action around the world. And then we also have a, you know, large networks of experts. So this will come back through as a theme uh, during this conversation, or my little conversation with you today. So really, um, there was a doctor, a medical doctor named Rick Weiss, who used to be a reporter for the Washington Post, and we were on the phone back in 2003 during an Ebola outbreak, and they, he was noticing we were talking about great apes dying uh, while everybody else was talking about uh, gorillas, uh, humans dying. And he, he posed this question, is this a human health issue or an animal health issue, or what is it? And as we were talking, I said, well, there's really just one health. And he got excited about that and put that in the Washington Post. And that kind of kicked off this rethinking, which was not really, you know, we already had great, we have great terms um, for comparative medicine and for comparative pathology and zoonotic diseases. We weren't really trying to rename those uh, when we were thinking. We were trying to reframe how we thought about this linkage between the health of people and animals and the environment. Um, and it's gotten many different permutations since we first talked about it. But that original story was about our view, the kind of the global view of a, an Ebola outbreak, mostly focused on after it starts and gets going and the emergency response, which tends to cost billions of dollars, um, rather than thinking about an upfront, upstream approach. So this is what we were seeing out in the field, that months before there were human cases, they were already seeing animals dying, of the, dying in the forest. Of course, if you're in the forest, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there uh, to hear it, does it really even happening? So what our first thoughts was about how do we pick up on this earlier uh, with that as a, this One Health approach. Um, and that was really about engaging with local communities. So some of you that do community practice can relate to this. You can't really, you know, now some people call it uh, rural participatory epidemiology, which is a great fancy word for us, um, 
But when you're just out with local communities, just talking, about, it's about talking with people and getting to know them and interacting with them, teaching them about how Ebola happens, teaching them how they can avoid it, but also enlisting their help so they become, these people in Central Africa became the front line of the surveillance system because they're hunters and they're out in the forest. They're the ones that can observe these events before the medical community ever does. So we basically created an early warning surveillance network from hunters and local people living in forested areas. It's been very successful where it's been rolled out. Of course, Africa's a big continent, and it's been, you know, we have not been able to do that everywhere. Around that same time, 2005, there was a big issue about new emerging influenzas. Once again, not so new, but in 2005, there was this H1 virus. It was in China. It was killing poultry. There were a few human cases there in Indonesia. And this is up actually in Mongolia. And working with the Mongolian um, Environment Department, it was really interesting. The Mongolians, from left over from Russian dominance days, had already kind of integrated in ecosystem health with their health systems because of all the work the Russians did with plague. So they're already thinking about this one health concept, they just didn't call it that. We were able to actually collect a virus from a swan in 2005, and that became part of the human vaccine construct because it was the only high path specimen the US had access to, got shared with St. Jude's and WHO, then went to Sanofi and became part of the human vaccine. So it's kind of interesting that this was coming together around that same time that people were really more concerned about Ebola and what we're able to do is push this into an article in Foreign Affairs because Foreign Affairs is, you know, deals with uh, po yes, international policy, statesmanship, um, and those areas. And it's a different audience than our medical audience. So it's really nice that they got excited about this idea, the next pandemic. So um, I and my colleague uh, Bob Cook, we were both at the Bronx Zoo at the time, posted this article and in here described this one health concept about the human animal link on some of these emerging diseases and pandemics. That got picked up by uh, Senator Joe Lieberman um, from Connecticut because our watershed of constituents, of course, as probably some people here live in Connecticut, and Westchester County with uh, uh, Congresswoman Nita Lowy who ran House Appropriations Committee and they kind of got interested that this was kind of a home idea um, and pushed for funding in the federal budget, uh, which turned out to be first an avian influenza network for around the world for collecting samples, which we launched. And then that morphed into the USAID um, Emerging Pandemic Threats Program. So I'll give you a few stories about this. But because of that work in the field, and then linking you know, with good science, but then getting into a policy journal, it turned into a $1 billion investment from the US government into emerging pandemic threats, zoonotic diseases, and the concept behind One Health. So interestingly enough, uh, USAID, not the medical community, but USAID has probably been the biggest push behind advancing One Health because of their financial commitment uh, to that over the last 10 years. So they started this, they asked us to get together as a consortium, Dr. John Mazette, who I don't see in the room, but will be speaking later. Yes, somebody's pointing. I'm glad, I think you're here with this, I hope you're here. Um, hopefully later today we'll talk a lot about this program and uh, John is really the PI on this, has been managing this program, very impressive. So I'm not gonna spend much time, but to say that AID has really made a, a really big push and forced us or asked us, <laughs> I would say forced us, um, to work in about 30 countries around the world and help countries really develop a One Health approach. There's been a huge advance in surveillance systems, a One Health kind of surveillance system, which was uh, the environment side with wildlife, uh, but also human surveillance and integrating that and getting people together and talk about it, discovering new viruses, hundreds and hundreds of new viruses that are lurking out there in the environment, particularly in wildlife making this data um, publicly available. So you'll hear from Dr. Larry Madoff later too with ProMed, who's been a big partner on all of this work, 
and really not just waiting to publish this data in scientific journals once again, but making it freely available to the public when governments say it's okay. So working with local governments, getting them thinking about sharing results early, reporting in, which is kind of underlying theme of the global health security agenda, which is better rep early detection and better reporting. So this really, this project really underpins the GSHA. And once again, not forgetting that community engagement and talking to your patients, talking with communities, getting them engaged, and sharing the information in ways that they can learn how to protect themselves. So we're not always treating them for Ebola, we're actually trying to help them protect them from getting Ebola in the first place. So kind of what's happened over the decades is we've seen this increasing um, occurrence of emerging infectious diseases. These are really, most of them are zoonotic. Most of them are not single species or human or animal diseases by themselves. The vast majority are zoonotic there. And the majority of them are linked to wildlife and the environment, of course. Uh, so there's kind of a temporal pattern that we don't see changing. Now, a lot of people have mapped out where these emerging disease events have occurred. So you get a picture like this if you map every EID event. But this is extremely biased by who's doing the science, like those of you in the room, and who reports it, who doesn't report it, who has diagnostic capabilities also. So you get a very skewed picture of the world about emerging infectious disease events because of that reporting bias and diagnostic bias um, there. When you look at the underlying factors that cause or are correlated, I want to be careful, these are really risk factors and correlations with emerging infectious disease events, we get a different map of the world when you map those factors rather than mapping the events. So it's kind of going once again a little upstream or turning this upside down, not like I was taught in the school um, about just mapping history. These are really about mapping risk factors. And you get this view of where emerging infectious disease events are likely to happen. Of course, they can travel, and there's easy statistics you can do to say where they might travel to based on the movement of people around the world. So you can get a map like this of risk at airports and arrivals in different countries based on the risk factors in the originating country and the amount of human movement now with globalization and trade. So about a billion people travel internationally every year. So there's a lot, there's a mechanism for that. And it's not just human diseases, it's animal diseases too. So if you're familiar in Europe right now, there's African swine fever, which for thousands of years was a disease in Africa, suddenly arrived in the Russian Caucasus, probably by the movement of meat um, products. It got established in Russia, and then now is moving towards uh, Western Europe, and in fact has bridged into, jumped into Western Europe uh, over time. So this is probably related not it's a little bit to human travel, but it's about humans traveling with meat products or contaminated material or trucks, um, transport can move this virus. It happens to be a virus that can live for um, over a year in the environment, so it's very easy to move it and introduce it to new areas. So it's not just about uh, people moving human diseases, but it's about also people, travel and trade, moving a uh, variety of diseases. Um, so we've heard a little about uh, climate change in our future. We can use some of this work to like project forward, so you can do some modeling with climate change and what those risk factors are, those environmental factors, and start to see a different picture. Once again, not looking back in history uh, for where these diseases occur, but looking forward so we can project forward where in the planet the risk factors are for different kinds of diseases. This is Nipah virus, so you see parts of the world are green, which means reduced risk. Parts of the world are red, which means increasing risk as we can anticipate, this is I think for 2050, yeah, with a, a very conservative scenario for, uh, for climate change. But we don't have to wait until 2050. We can really see some things with severe weather, as also was referred to earlier this morning um, with the forest fires. Um, and this, you'll hear more about this with Dr. Anyamba, who's here, Dr. Asaf Anyamba. We did this work together about looking at something um, as frequent as El Nino events, the Southern Oscillation event, and saying, well, that has an impact globally on weather, and that, of course, affects diseases, not just infectious diseases, 
and I think Dr. Martin will talk about a little more with some non-communicable, non-infectious disease issues after I do. Um, but certainly with weather, we see huge impacts on food production and nutrition, which really boils down to nutrition for the human side, and that, you know, the impacts of that on human health, but also on animal health. In the wild world, you know, we see starving populations of marine mammals, marine birds. Uh, we get flooding in areas, so you see changes in vector-borne diseases, of course. Um, but so it has great, you know, broad ra ramifications for health. The other component really is to look at this across stakeholders. So what we're really trying to say here in this 21st century to get away from um, just focusing on, you know, a particular disease and its implications, but think about across sectors and how to get more people at that one health table besides physicians or veterinarians or some, a few environmental health people. It's really a broader impact. So when we look at these tens of billions of dollars for emerging disease events or disease events like that, we see that any single sector, when you analyze that, gives you a very underrepresented or um, underappreciated um, estimate of the economic impact. What we really see, the medical cost on these diseases, you see the little doctor's bag up there, is actually a very small percentage of the societal cost of these. So we kind of use this as a point to leverage, you know, the, the role of private industry in this because private industry is a huge stakeholder. They have a lot to lose. The travel and tourism industry is, has a lot to lose when we have these outbreaks. They should be at the table when we're talking about health. Um, so we're really trying to change that paradigm about who's sitting at the table, who's included in these conversations, because there are a lot of people in society who have a lot to lose, but they're typically not invited to discuss what we can do to prevent these things from happening. So I would want to just say this, and I think uh, Dr. Frank Barrett is going to talk later, um, and he will hopefully get in more in this uh, when you hear him later this morning or this afternoon about this context. So we really don't want to force you to say that every health issue, no matter what it is, is a perfect balance of environment and animals and people. Um, it's not. So context really matters. So some of these issues really you need a strong group of, in one area but you, and a few people in another area. But I would like to kind of remind you, um, no matter how we do this, I'm always pushing more for the private sector uh, to get engaged. So I'll show you a couple of examples like that right now. One is a common infectious disease, leptospirosis. It affects all of mammals. It affects humans. It's in many parts of the world, it's underreported. I think in Indonesia, they say that 25% um, of what's diagnosed as dengue fever is really leptospirosis and could just be treated with doxycycline. So I think we underappreciate some of these common diseases, especially in the developing world. Um, we took, I'll just kind of start my talk again and say, here's a map. These are clusters of um, PCR and serologically positive cases. In this, we don't actually have the data for humans, but we have the data for dogs, so we're going to use dogs as a proxy. And we get this map of the distribution of this disease historically in the United States. And we go like, well, that's interesting. Once again, this is really biased by who can afford the diagnostic work, who will submit a sample, who doesn't submit a sample. So there's diagnostic bias, there's reporting bias. And this is from one uh, national laboratory that doesn't even operate everywhere in the country. So you, you know, there's biases all inherent in this. We take that same approach and say, well, what are the underlying risk factors that correlate with the positive test results? And we can do some dependence plots like this and look at forest cover, uh, socioeconomic data, census data, and look at what lines up with positive test results. And you get these factors or the risk factors for what aligns with positive test results, either serological or PCR. And we can then map the result, the risk factors instead of mapping the disease. And we get this picture of leptospirosis risk in the United States. This is the vaccination picture for the United States. So it's completely disconnected with the risk map because, once again, vaccinations have to do with uh, where the pharmaceutical company is really marketing their product, who has the money to pay for vaccination, which clinicians are tuned in to thinking about it. Uh, so once again, there's a set of biases that don't relate to the environment that this organism lives in. Um, 
And then just to remind you, there's the cluster analysis of positive cases. So there's a big, uh, you use this as an example of this environmental factors or how do we get that involved? How do we bring those data sets in uh, to really think more broadly about what's driving infectious diseases? And I see my call our colleague from Chile and I said I wanted to talk to you about, I think Chile is a big country that could really start to think more broadly about some of these environmental factors and how to use them to advance medicine. We have another project that I want to just briefly introduce, and Dr. Mindy Rostel is here. We'll go into more depth on this, but it's turned into, we see it as a kind of a beautiful example of a One Health project with Rift Valley Fever. Uh, we're doing this with the U.S. Defense Department and all local partners in South Africa. Um, it's a huge study site you can see here. It's about the size of Ohio. Uh, where we've enrolled farmers, communal farms, commercial farms, the public health people, the agriculture people, the environment people, the weather service, Dr. Nyamba is involved. It's a complex disease if you just wanted to focus on the virology, but it's even bigger than that. So we have a couple of mosquito species vectors. It's related to rainfall and flooding. It gets it infects livestock, has huge impacts on livestock and farmers' livelihoods, and then it gets into people and causes uh, fatal disease in people. So the R1 health approach is to bring in climatologists, soil scientists, vegetation ecologists. If I'd done this 20 years ago, I would have just invited some virologists and a few MDs and a few veterinarians, and that would have been a nice One Health project, but not nearly as impactful as really bringing in other sectors to engage them, including the private sector with the wool growers, the dairy farmers, and really getting private industry because they're the ones that have a lot to lose. So they should be, they're part of the problem actually. Um, so they need to be part of the solution. And we can do some good economics there too because there's benefits across sectors in humans, livestock, even international trade. South Africa would like to export meat. When they have an outbreak, their exports get shut down. So they have like all these different knock-on effects that could be addressed and look at what those costs would be. In this case, it's really about vaccinating animals to prevent human disease, much like we do here with rabies. So it's really a great example of a One Health approach. There's a huge investment now about in, uh, increasing livestock production in Africa. Uh, so these are kind of projections for 2050. This is another USAID supported project uh, to say, what are the disease risks? What are the health risks? related to this. So we're kind of using some of the same work I mentioned to you before about looking at risk factors to do some risk projections. And you can see we kind of scale. This is Ethiopia to get a higher resolution because we've started adding in things like poultry production, cattle production, and using those as additional factors. So this is kind of a list of those to say these risk factors, as we've seen in Asia, what does that mean for Africa as they ramp up agricultural production? Um, will that be the future epicenter of pandemics or epidemics, a shift from China and Asia to Africa as a, since they are linked a lot to livestock production, and kind of generate maps at a national level for countries to start a dialogue. We don't expect them to start um, changing a lot for 2050 now, but we do want to change their conversation about One Health. So this is really about here is linked to poultry production. So you can start saying, well, as you increase poultry production, you're going to have more higher risk, particularly influenza. And Dr. Gray, I hope you'll talk a little more about influenza. A little. Okay. He's nodding a kind of semi-nod. You'll hear that tomorrow. So just to finish up, I'm good with time here. Um, you know, we're moving kind of from that country level, so I want to kind of just briefly mention, you know, how you or your students can get involved at the international kind of policy level, and I'll come back to, to country and on the ground. Um, there's always the UN system, you know, if any of you are living in the New York area, so, you know, you do actually have uh, good access to the UN, and I would encourage you to find ways to kind of get engaged, but it's a big, huge massive organization with hundreds of programs and hundreds and thousands of people. Um, so sometimes it's, it's complicated uh, to really engage with that level, but I don't want to dissuade you from trying. Um, but this is a big, uh, the UN is a 
not just a big tanker that you is slow to change direction, but a fleet of tankers that's really hard to change direction. But I would encourage you, um, if you especially if you think you have another decade or two in your career, to engage, and you might see some changes over that time period. It's, it'll make you feel good later in life. And so, you know, that is could be attending. You, may, you start in the audience, you might end up, uh, here's some of our folks um, that are actually get called in, warm their way into a committee, do some testimonies, kind of try and get people thinking there. Um, it does have impact. There's the UN Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. So Catherine Chalaba, who has been mentioned earlier, has really gotten us engaged. Uh, Chadia Wanaus, Dr. Wanaus, who cannot be here today. Uh, will she be online speaking? Possibly, we'll zoom in later. Uh, she's been, had a leadership role here with the DRR, um, uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, for decades. Uh, bringing in health is actually a disaster. Traditionally, um, the framework, which requires countries to prepare for disasters, never included health as a disaster, only as an after effect of other disasters. So with Chadia's work, and we've all contributed to help and show up, we show these same slides I'm showing you today at this big convention with 3,000 people and get them to think differently. And now they've moved to saying, actually, health disasters uh, warrant health, warrants special prevention and preparedness for all the member countries in and of itself. You don't, it doesn't have to be post-tsunami people get cholera. It's actually disease can have primacy and countries need to be prepared. So that's been good. We're doing a lot of work with the World Bank at that policy scale, but for them it's not so much about this is important, which we're kind of talking about today, but how to do it. So this operationalized operationalization, big fancy word, just means, you know, how do we just go out and do it? And so we've worked with the bank on a step-by-step -step, uh, guide. You can download this. It works at community level, it works at a state level, it works at national levels, but it's kind of a how-to guide to start getting One Health uh, working in your place. There's kind of a road map, I think, for those of you in the room, you've probably engaged with uh, capacity assessments, some kinds of assessments, whether or not it's at your medical school or assessments, um, or maybe you do that, and all of you probably, you know, get pulled into being part of expert networks. So there's places for us to plug in to this kind of global picture of One Health and how it, um, how it ties together. Getting back to that prevention thing, so for us in epidemiology or the world of health, you know, we're ta always talking about how can we work further upstream in prevention and um, to move the curve, you know, say moving left on the epi curve there so we can actually have uh, results, which could mean a uh, lower burden of disease, lower death rate, whatever that might be, but we want to reduce the impact of these diseases by using good prevention. What we found in the global security world, um, they kind of see it, they call it left of boom. Uh, so we call it moving the epi curve to the left. The security defense uh, sector calls it left of boom. That makes a lot of sense to us. And we're really kind of using their language. So kind of taking what we've been talking about in One Health and putting it in terms that they can understand, which is prevent and detect, respond, and recovery after one of these events and translating that in terms for the, to engage the defense community, the security community, so they can too uh, become part of the One Health table. So we're just releasing this this la last week, next week. This will come out about bio threats. So uh, we see another large sector of society that's very interested in the health professions coming in and thinking about One Health and helping to reduce biological threats and engaging in health security and translating it into the same things we've been talking about, prevention, detect, respond, and recover, and putting it into terms that the security uh, world can understand so they can really get engaged with us too on some of this. And never really forgetting, just to finish up, that it really gets back to local people and local communities. What can we do for it? not just educating them, but actually bringing them in so they're part of the One Health system. That's it. Thank you very much.